Hi all and welcome to a live interaction with National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today we will be exploring black corals in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. We will begin the program promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're having trouble with the audio, please use the information on this slide. Hi everyone and welcome to this live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today we will be exploring black corals of Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. But we, before we dive into the National Marine Sanctuary system and the black corals of Flower Garden Banks, we're going to turn it over to Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to give us a rundown of what this interaction looks like. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Hannah. Well, again, hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, today's live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. As Hannah said, my name is Joe and I'm from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So before we get things started, I do wanna share the program uh, with you just briefly. If you head to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find the website. And we bring science, adventure, exploration and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond, uh, generally running 30 to 50 live events a month. But since schools have closed, we've been broadcasting live into the homes of educators, um, uh, students and parents uh, everywhere up to three to four live events a day so if you scan down the website you can see a spot to sign up for the newsletter we send out updates every week with the new events and then I just want to highlight next week World Oceans Day is on the 8th and we have a ton of ocean content coming up so under lessons I'll just share a few examples with you here we'll be diving into the Galapagos we'll be feeding sand tiger sharks at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada, we'll be talking to ocean rowers, marine adventurers, we'll be heading to the Arctic, deep sea with Diva Amon. We have tons and tons of events, including another really fun one, Exploring the Blue uh, with NOAA Sanctuaries 360. So lots of fun uh, ocean events to take in next week. So we are using Slido. Uh, if you haven't used Slido before, the website's really easy to find. It's sli.com. Do, and it's going to ask you for an event code and it's just coral for today so in slido we have some poll questions that we'll go through uh, during both of our presentations today as well you can put your questions in there uh, as well as the question bar uh, you can upvote others to the top if it's a similar question to yours there's a direct link you can use which i'm going to post in the chat in just a moment and if you're quick with your phone you can even scan this qr code i have up here in the corner so lots of ways to find the Slido room, take part in the polls, and make today's event a little more interactive. All right, I'm gonna come back from that screen share now and we'll keep things moving along. So really excited. Today we're gonna to take a virtual field trip. This is the third trip this week that we've taken to Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. It's been a ton of fun. And today we're gonna to meet expedition lead, Dr. Mercer Brugler from New York City College of Technology and the American Museum of natural history. But before we throw things over to Mercer, Hannah McDonald's going to take over for a moment, education specialist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Thank you so much, Joe. And I'm excited about this Slido feature. The link to join will be dropped in the chat and we'll have our first question in just a moment. Today, I wanted to talk to you about NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. We're a network of 14 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments. 
we encompass over 600,000 square miles of marine waters, including the kelp forests in California, to corals in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Lots of different marine ecosystems that we protect. To get started, I wanted to ask how many people are watching this live stream with you? Now this is over in Slido. Joe explained where Slido was during his portion of this interaction. And the link is also dropped right in the chat. So please feel free to enter the Slido room and tell us how many people you're watching this with. All right, Hannah, so I see the numbers starting to go up. People are finding the Slido room. A reminder too, you can find it quickly on your computer, just sli.do in the address bar. Uh, and then the event code today is Coral. So lots of ways to find your way into the room. And if we look at the early results, we have a lot of solo action today. Gotcha. People are still social distancing. I, I like it. All right. And we have one other question in the Slido room as well. Have you heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before? All right. I think we have uh, some three Peters who've been joining us all week because 100% uh, have heard of the sanctuaries before so far. That's awesome. Yes, Joe, as you mentioned, this is our third leg of the Flower Garden Banks expedition wrap up. So if you missed any of the expeditions that we've gone over so far, they're also in Joe's recordings um, on his YouTube channel. So feel free to check those out after this. So I also wanted to take you on a virtual tour of our National Marine Sanctuaries. We're gonna start in the most northwest corner of continental United States in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, where they protect incredible tide pools and kelp forests and deep sea ecosystems as well. Going further south into California, we have Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. Here you see an elephant seal on the beach. Bordering Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary which protects deep sea corals. And also in Northern California, we have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We did an expedition overview on Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary as well, where they found brooding octopus as seen in this photo. Our last sanctuary in California is Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, 25 miles off the coast of Santa Barbara. And it, they protect lush, uh, kelp ecosystems around the Channel Islands. Further west in the Pacific, we have Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is the largest marine conservation area in the world. And we also have Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary protecting the breeding grounds for the humpback whale. And even further in the Pacific, we have the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa protecting Big Mama which is the longest living coral known in the ocean. Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, we are going to hear all about today. So I won't give much of an introduction, but it is 100 miles off the coast of Galveston, Texas. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary protects the Florida Keys Reef Track off of Florida. Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary protects a live bottom reef ecosystem off of Georgia. And Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of North Carolina is our very first National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the Civil War era USS Monitor. And going from our first National Marine Sanctuary all the way to our most recent, designated in November of just 2019, we have Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. And as you can see from this photograph, quite a unique marine ecosystem here. We have partially submerged shipwrecks in the Potomac River. Going further north, we have Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary located in Massachusetts Bay, really well known for its whale watching. And lastly, we have, and not least, we have our sanctuary in the Great Lakes, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, protecting over 200 shipwrecks. So now that we've gone through a tour, have you ever visited a National Marine Sanctuary before? This is also in Slido. If you're just joining, the link is in the chat. If you're on the web, it's Slido. You can type that in the address bar. 
And the event code is CORALS. All right, so 62% of our audience today have visited a sanctuary. That's awesome. Great to hear. So now that we've done a little bit of a virtual tour of where we have our National Marine Sanctuaries, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what the system does. So the National Marine Sanctuary system protects things like the sea giants, the humpback whales in Monterey Bay, to the small sea life like corals and reef fish. We protect places with abundant biodiversity. And we provide shelter for some of the most charismatic marine species like this endangered Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtle. We also protect maritime heritage as you saw in our Mallows Bay Potomac River site as well as Thunder Bay, as well as many other sites that have shipwrecks. And we are also mandated to do resource protection to save these special places for generations to come. We do that through our National Marine Sanctuaries Act and we're mandated to do education and outreach to connect with people like you in programs like this. So these are your special marine places. These are your places to paddle, your places to fish, to snorkel, to boat, to surf. These places are yours to recreate in. Ooh, and here we have our quiz question from my section. I know I only mentioned this once, but if we have a few repeaters, we might get a high percentage on this. Joe, how does it look over in Slido? All right, you are absolutely correct. We've got about 80% uh, nailed it with 600,000. Uh, All right, I think that's the highest percentage we've gotten on this quiz question so far. Out of our 10 plus programs, that's pretty good. 600,000 square miles of marine waters is correct. So now after I've done the overview of the system, I'll tell you a little bit about why we get to speak with Dr. Mercer Brugler today. And that is because NOAA awarded a telepresence exploration award. Now telepresence, tricky word, means ship to shore. So this exploration, means that exploration was happening out in the ocean on a research vessel, but being broadcasted to institutions and public venues and people like you and I from the internet. So NOAA awarded this funding to the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, who decided to do their research in Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary, making this a partnership with the National Marine Sanctuary System. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mercer to talk about his leg of the Flower Garden Banks expedition with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Now Dr. Mercer Brugler is from the New York City College of Technology and he was the lead scientist on the black corals leg of this expedition. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and change it over to Dr. Mercer to give us some insight on the black corals of Flower Garden Banks. Wonderful, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Mercer Brugler and I'm coming to you from just outside of uh, New York City in uh, Rockland County. Uh, thank you for your interest in the Flower Garden Banks as well as black corals. I look, I look forward to uh, sharing uh, my love uh, with you guys today. It looks like there's a, a great attendance today, so thank you guys for, for being here. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently an associate professor at New York City College of Technology, which is located in Brooklyn, and uh, there's about 17,000 uh, students at this particular college, and uh, it is ranked currently the number one most ethnically diverse college in the Northeast, and so this very much uh, allows me to pursue my academic mission, and that is to change the face of marine biology, to, uh, to, to increase the number of underrepresented students in the sciences. And so what I do is I recruit students from City Tech and bring them to uh, my molecular lab at the American Museum of Natural History, which is located in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Estefania Rodriguez, uh, who's a curator there of marine invertebrates, for allowing me to use her lab and to, to 
to mentor the students there. So, so working behind the scenes is fun for me. It's fun for the students. Uh, we spend a lot of time going through the collections and, and, and really sparking interest uh, in these students by opening up cabinets and, uh, and picking out specimens and letting them uh, hold them. These uh, three individuals here are Bathynomus giganteus, uh, the giant isopods. Now, once we, uh, we, we transition into the molecular lab, it's just a typical molecular lab. Um, you know, the, the specimens, they, they don't look very impressive uh, in the ethanol and things like that. So in come three superheroes, all right? From left to right, on the left, we have Emma Hickerson, in the middle, Marissa Nuttall, and on the right, G.P. Schmoll. These three superheroes uh, have helped me not only recruit, retain, and inspire all of these undergraduates. And, and so uh, it, you can only get them so far in the lab, but these three individuals have allowed upwards of four students a year to, to go out sailing on the research vessel Manta, deploying a number of remotely operated vehicles like the Mohawk, uh, letting them drive the vehicles, letting them uh, uh, actually deploy the vehicles, uh, collect the specimens and, and partake in, in these expeditions. And it's been a, a game changer for me. It's been a game changer for the students and a life changer as well. I'm extremely thankful uh, for, for what you guys have been doing for, for myself and these students. Uh, this partnership began in 2005. That's when I started going out to the Flower Garden Banks, and uh, they started inviting my students uh, in 2015. Extremely thankful for this. I mean, literally, these lives have changed. These students start as associate degree students, and now many of them are pursuing masters and PhDs at, at places like Cornell and Yale. Just phenomenal uh, for these students. So thank you guys for that. And what really inspires them is they go from looking at these specimens in a, in a jar or a tube to actually seeing these things alive in the flower garden banks, all the different colors, shapes, and sizes of these marine animals. They look like plants, but these things are corals and sea stars. These are animals. And uh, they, so, to date, they have discovered a number of new species. Uh, this is one that's probably going to be published in another week or two. And uh, just, uh, just a, a little tease, it may be named after this new species may be named after one of these three superheroes uh, that I that I hold close to my heart so, uh, so we'll see we'll see stay tuned all right so what is a coral well a coral as I just said is a is a marine a carnivorous marine animal and uh, it unlike us we just have one mouth corals have thousands of individual little mouths and they're called polyps so here is the mouth of one individual feeding mouth or polyp and a ring of tentacles around there uh, and so they're either going to sting their prey or or, uh, or, or, uh, or, or essentially cover it in mucus in order to, to get it. And I'll show you those structures here shortly. Uh, the corals you're probably most familiar with are stony corals or hard corals. Uh, these form the coral reefs that you dive or snorkel on. And uh, they lay down a calcium carbonate or limestone based uh, skeleton and the, the living tissue is on top. Now, in order to defend themselves, uh, corals uh, and sea anemones and their relatives like jellyfish have these nematocysts or these stinging cells. Because uh, a lot of these corals and anemones can't move, they have to defend themselves. And so, so when you say, say, for example, you just uh, touched a jellyfish, your skin would hit this little trigger here and out would come this uh, harpoon, this nematocyst. There could be a number of toxins uh, on that particular nematocyst to ward off uh, uh, potential predators. And as I mentioned also, a lot of these corals secrete uh, copious amounts of mucus and that also helps defend them. So the stars of the shows today, uh, sorry, the star of the show, uh, black corals. You're probably asking yourself right now, black coral? That looks like a white coral. Well, black corals are so called because the skeleton is black. The living tissue on top can be any number of colors from white, as you see here, to green, to purple, you name it. Uh, they're actually very, very colorful animals. There's currently a little over 270 species uh, known throughout the world, and these are distributed worldwide, primarily a deep water group. Um, uh, but we do have a couple shallow water populations, and one of those is in the, in the flower garden banks. Now, given their history, the first genus that was described was anti pathies, anti being against, pathies disease, and the whole reason behind that is uh, people used to take their skeletons, so they would kill the coral, take their skeletons, grind it into a powder, use it for medicine, or they would take the whole skeleton and make it into amulets and scepters to ward off evil and injury. It's pretty interesting. And still today, places like Maui Divers Jewelry uh, makes really nice pieces. Um, I, I realize these are beautiful, 
but you're going to learn soon how long-lived a lot of these black corals are. So I'm hoping to uh, stop this process soon. Black corals can get pretty, uh, pretty big. On the left is Bob Stone from Alaska. He is holding uh, uh, either a telepathies or a bathopathies, a black coral. And over here on the right is Dennis Apresco, the, the world's leading authority on black corals. And he's holding a bathopathies from uh, New Zealand. Now, black corals hold the record for the oldest, longest lived coral in the ocean. And so Hannah and or Joe, can you please release the first question about how old is this particular black coral? And uh, for those of you who don't see the question, uh, it says that this particular colony was collected off of the Hawaiian Islands at, at about 450 meters depth. Uh, they used uh, multiple isotopic ratios to try to figure out the age. Joe right. and or Hannah? Absolutely. So for those who took part in the original uh, Slido polls, Slido is open. We have the new poll questions up there. I'm going to give everyone a few seconds uh, to jump in and attack that first question. Um, well, I, oh, there we go. We can see the vote starting to come up now. I'll read that question one more time. Um, let's see. There it is. So, the black coral was collected near Hawaii at about 450 meters depth. So radiocarbon dating revealed it's a marine animal of what age? 42 years, 426, 4,265, 42,650. Trick question, they only live 24 hours. Or super tricky question, black corals are rocks and thus not alive. 75% rolled with 4,265 years, Mercer. Well done, audience. That is awesome. Yes, over 4,000 years old and still growing strong, which means this uh, particular individual started growing about the time the Egyptians were, were building their pyramids. That is really long lived. I don't want to see these things turned into jewelry. I really don't. So while black corals are very long lived and the, the longest lived uh, coral, they're not the longest lived oceanic animal and that that record goes to the glass sponge uh, this sponge here on the left uh, was aged at somewhere between 17 to 18 thousand years old uh, made out of glass or silica and so some of these uh, oceanic animals can get uh, quite long lived now black corals also hold the record not only for the oldest coral but the deepest uh, at 8600 meters and anytime we talk about meters we've got to multiply it by three to get feet so 8 16 24 add some change we're talking about 26 27 thousand feet beneath the sea surface uh, schizopathies of is is living down there absolutely amazing uh, just just think about trying to deal with the pressures uh, at that depth. It's crazy. So here are some uh, general shapes and sizes of black corals that you find in the world's oceans. This would be stichopathies. This is an unbranched whip. This would be parentopathies. It's either an unbranched bottle brush or a highly branched bottle brush. We have leopathies, the big orange bush. We have these feathers, uh, either bathopathies or umbellopathies. Some of these feathers can be on long stalks. All of these are different representatives of black corals. Or we can have multi-branched feathers, uh, and this genus is, uh, is telepathies. All right, and uh, I have to give a shout out to Jeremy Horowitz, a new and upcoming black coral expert down in Townsville, Australia, working on his PhD. Uh, he recently collected this Medusa looking black coral from Papua New Guinea and uh, is recently describing, or is currently describing this as a new genus and species. So black corals come in all sorts of different shapes uh, and sizes. Now, if you take that living tissue and you peel it away, this is what you see. You see that black skeleton and you also see a bunch of spines. Black corals are also called thorny corals and their spines can come in a number of different shapes and sizes. Some are branched, they kind of look like antlers. Uh, others have ornamentation, little subspines or papillae on those. But by and large, the spines are used for species ID when you're looking at the morphology or the anatomy uh, of these, uh, these, these species. Here are our examples of the feeding mouths. So these are hexa corals, hexa being six. And so surrounding the mouth, you have six tentacles that aid in capture of, of prey. And then go ahead and stick that into the mouth. Black corals are pretty interesting in that uh, they have a pumping mechanism with their, their feeding mouths. So this polyp, this feeding mouth is big. This one is small. In order to move nutrients along the length of the branch internally, they have this pumping mechanism, big, small, big, small, to move that food around once captured. Now, in the ocean, everything wants to get off the sea floor to get up in the currents, and black corals are no exception. A lot of things love living on black corals. 
but there's a big problem with that. So things that live on black corals will change the morphology or the anatomy of a black coral. So for example, this is the newest species that we found from the flower garden banks. There is a symbiotic worm that lives along the main axis. The branches of the black coral will literally grow around the worm and create a, a little column or a worm run to protect that worm. So the presence of this symbiont, this associate, changes the anatomy of the black coral. If you didn't know that, you would maybe describe it as a new species. So, so symbionts change morphology. That's a problem. Another problem with black corals is whenever you look at their DNA, in particular mitochondrial DNA, the powerhouse of the cell, it evolves or changes upwards of 100 times slower than every other animal that consists of two or more cells. So, so we have to look at a lot of DNA to try to find a, a, a new species. Now, while looking at the DNA, uh, we have found some pretty interesting things, and this is case number one. What you're looking at is, based on morphology, we would, this is an unbranched whip. If we saw this out in the environment, we would say, oh, well, this is stickopathies. Well, once we sequenced the DNA of a bunch of different supposed stickopathies, what we found was these are two very unrelated black corals that have converged on the same morphology. So no longer can we look at these and say, oh, that's stickopathies. We're going to have to look at the DNA to figure out which family of black corals these belong to. The opposite has also been found to be true. These three corals were collected in the, uh, the Northeast Pacific Ocean along the Lucian Islands. So we've got a planar tree, uh, an unbranched bottle brush, medium branched and highly branched bottle brush. So anatomically, hugely different. Genetically, every gene we sequence, identical. So radically different morphology, DNA is exactly the same. What's going on? We have no idea. Please come help us find out. Um, so, so as Hannah mentioned, this particular cruise I'm about to show you some highlight photos from uh, wouldn't have been possible without a very generous uh, donation from uh, from NOAA. And I'm also extremely thankful to GFOE, uh, the president Dave LaVolvo, VP Melissa Ryan, uh, Todd Gregory, and his group of engineers for bringing me on this grant and, and allowing me a, a whole cruise to, my, to myself uh, to, to study black corals. That's just that was awesome. Thank you guys very very much. And we're able to beam this uh, this cruise live uh, to you guys. You could have been literally in your bed, in your pajama jammy jams, just hanging out, watching us explore in real time. I loved it. It, it was a game changer for me. So so we uh, we my, my team flew to the Gulf of Mexico. No, we flew to Galveston, Texas. Took uh, uh, the art, uh, research vessel Manta offshore to the flower garden banks. And for those of you who are new to the flower garden banks, they are uh, essentially raised mountains uh, underneath uh, the sea. And uh, they're raised because there's salt domes uh, underneath them. So here was uh, the team that I brought from New York City. Uh, here is me in the middle. On the left, we have Craig Dawes, originally from Jamaica, and Eliza Gonzalez from Puerto Rico. And uh, so they uh, were literally the face of the cruise. These two students were the face of the cruise. So they were communicating with the general public. They were helping uh, run uh, the, the science. Uh, they were deploying the remotely operated vehicle, Yogi, recovering it, uh, helping with the specimen uh, pickling, you name it. And, uh, and, and again, when we were talking with you guys on land, they were the, they were the, the conduit. They were the go-to, which was phenomenal. And so my second question is, what do you think Craig and Eliza's academic level was at the time of sailing? Were these, or I, I guess I'll have uh, Joe and or, uh, read out the question and, and answers, please. All right, absolutely. So now's the time to jump back in for the next uh, question. Two underrepresented minorities, Craig Dawes and Eliza Gonzalez led the science party. What was their academic level at the time of sailing? Were they high school students, undergrads, master's degree students? Uh, doctoral students, postdocs, or assistant professors. So another couple seconds to see a few more votes come in. And let's take a quick look here and see where we ended. All right, 75% went undergrads. Wow, well done. You guys are listening really closely. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Undergraduates. So two underrepresented undergraduates essentially running this the third leg of this cruise it was phenomenal i'm extremely thankful to noah and gfoe and the flower garden staff for for allowing this to happen that was awesome and i hope to see this happen again soon it was they did a phenomenal job so thank you guys so here is uh what it looks like out in the flower garden banks this is one of the deeper banks we're not getting a whole lot of light down here we got to bring our own lighting uh but what you see was what looks like a bunch of weeds 
these aren't weeds. All of these little uh, animals here, all these little fans uh, and bottle brushes, these are the black corals. I, in, back in 2005, when I first went out there, I was blown away by the number and the diversity of black corals out there in the flower gardens. It is phenomenal. Um, want to run through some of the typical black corals you're going to see out there. This white fan here is Phanopathes expansa. This is Antipathies atlantica. Antipathies furcata, kind of looks like horse hair. Plumapathies panacea, it looks like uh, some sediment was uh, getting caught on all of its mucus. Elatopathies abatina, there's the green variety and the white variety. Tanacetopathies, this can be a single bottle brush or highly branched, which is what you're seeing here. Um, and then the, the ROV pilot's uh, least favorite black coral, this is stickopathies, or at least I hope it's stickopathies. And uh, so these get stuck in the props uh, of the remotely operated vehicles and, and kind of gums things up. Uh, here's a close up of what the feeding mouths look like uh, along that unbranched uh, whip black coral. And uh, this is a close up of one of those weedy species, Acanthopathies thyroides. So if you look closely uh, at the front of the colony, all of these little dots are the individual feeding mouths. So this particular black coral has very tiny, tiny, tiny polyps. This is what the black, uh, the, the black, the back of uh, the black coral looks like. So all the polyps are on one side and just a little thin layer of tissue on the other. And I thought this was unusual. I usually don't see uh, associates on acanthopathies, but this one uh, had a brittle star, a relative of a sea star uh, crawling on it. This was the highlight of the cruise for me. This uh, may not look like a lot, but this individual here, this bottle brush right here uh, we think is a, a new species of stylopathies. Now stylopathies is known from the Gulf of Mexico but not from the flower garden banks and we've done a lot of exploration never come across it until now uh, so we're currently working on a, a new species description for this guy. So moving away from black corals I wanted to wow you with some very impressive imagery uh, from the cruise uh, and this is compliments of Emma Hickerson who helped put these slides uh, together for me. So first and foremost a toadfish. A toadfish kind of looks like it has a beard or a goatee on its lower jaw. The spotted batfish, now these are all sorts of animals that we saw uh, on this third leg of the cruise. This batfish looks like it's using its fins to walk around. Hmm, evolution, interesting. Uh, and it had this little projection here uh, that kept coming out of maybe its nose. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it kept, it looked like it was fishing. Very, very interesting. Uh, the Maori basslet, uh, apparently this is a pretty rare fish, a beautiful little spot um, uh, back here, maybe uh, tricking predators. Maybe predators think that's an eyeball beautiful fish. Uh, marbled grouper. We found quite a few of these marbled grouper all hanging out together. Huge fish, absolutely gigantic. Uh, we also saw a snowy grouper uh, as well. This guy was nicely tucked in a little, little, uh, little home here. Uh, Long-spined porcupine fish. Uh, we did not, whoops, we did not see him uh, blow up. Uh, cute little thing. Uh, the invasive lionfish. We saw these guys all over the place. The short-nosed green eye, the way this guy was reflecting the light was just gorgeous. We spent a lot of time looking at this particular individual. The hunch scorpion fish, just resting on the ground, waiting for a snack to come by. And oh, this guy, this is one individual. It looks like a pile of different animals, but no, this is a single basket star that is all curled up, maybe sleeping, um, and not currently feeding. If we look closer at all the arms, these are the arms of a single individual. Can you imagine trying to keep track of all those arms? Incredible. Uh, we have a lot of sea cucumbers out there. These are big, big sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers are known as the, uh, the earthworms of the ocean. And if anybody doesn't know about the pearl fish, P-E-A-R-L, the pearl fish, I encourage you to, uh, to look at some uh, YouTube videos uh, after this presentation. Uh, a, quite a few large crabs out there. This particular crab uh, opened up its carapace here, at least the lower part of the carapace, and was uh, oxygenating its, uh, its babies uh, that it was holding inside. That was pretty cool. We had a bunch of arrow crabs. These particular arrow crabs had uh, purple pinchers, and it seemed that they were doing a bit of a mating dance. We found a whole vertical wall filled with these particular shrimp. I don't know if it was a mating swarm or a feeding swarm. I have no idea, but wow, the biomass was impressive. 
Uh, these particular shrimp, two absolutely beautiful shrimp hanging out uh, on a sponge. Uh, this is the Peterson shrimp, this purple and white. And over here on the right is the golden coral shrimp. Uh, these leggy things that you see sticking out, these are uh, crinoids uh, or sea lilies. This is actually two organisms. Uh, the foundation of this animal is a sponge. So the white thing is a sponge. And then on top of that sponge, all these little feeding mouths might be a zoanthid or a parasitic cnidarian living on top of this sponge. Here we have a cephalopod. This is uh, an octopus. You can see the funnel here. This was a black coral where, and, and there was a, there's a crinoid or a sea lily on top of it with the little legs here holding on to the black coral. And this was the uh, egg case of a shark. I had never seen an egg case of a shark laid on a black coral before, so that was pretty neat. And of course, uh, one of everybody's favorites, the pink tipped sea anemone. And here's a close up of the, of the tentacles of this particular sea anemone, absolutely gorgeous. And getting close to the end here, uh, we noticed that the starfish was up on its a, it, on the tippy tips of its five uh, legs. And so we got a little bit closer and we looked at this particular leg and we zoomed in and wow, this particular starfish was up on its tippy toes getting off the ground because it was spawning. It was releasing gametes into the water column uh, to reproduce. I had never seen that before. You can see some of the tube feet hanging out uh, here as well. Now, this brings me to my third and last question of the presentation. We came across this animal that we called the purple fruit snack monster uh, on the cruise. And everybody on the cruise, as well as on the shore that were participating, had no idea what this thing was. Uh, for size reference, over on the left, we've got an arrow crab. And so I want to open up the question, what in the world do you think this thing is? All right, so jump back into Slido. We'll give you a few seconds to get your thoughts in. Is it a sponge, a sea cucumber, a jellyfish, a sea anemone, a squid? Or is it brown algae covered in flamingo tongues, which are small marine snails? So a couple more seconds, and let's see what we think. All right. Whew. Neck and neck, 30% between sponge and sea cucumber. Oh, wow. <laughs> I feel like I'm back on the cruise because that's that's what we kind of settled on uh, on the cruise. Well, we used the slurp gun to get this thing into the remote, remote, remotely operated vehicle, brought it up to the surface, and look at this thing. It unconstricted, and it was a sea anemone. And uh, so over on the left, you see all the tentacles. You see the column. And down here, all those these things that we were calling the purple fruit snacks uh, were defensive structures. And so th these are filled with nematocysts or these stinging cells. And this is known as one of the most highly venomous uh, sea anemones known. Unbelievable. So I'm glad we didn't touch it. Um, we think uh, it's definitely a new species, maybe even a new genus. And so uh, we're hitting this hard uh, with, with, uh, with DNA sequencing to try to try to nail that down. Uh, with that, I would love to open the floor to questions. Um, and, and before I do, I just want to say thank you to you uh, for, for being here today and your interest in black corals. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the Flower Garden Banks for, for supporting me, my research, uh, as well as as, uh, these priceless underrepresented students. Thank you uh, for everything that you do for us. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, Mercer, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, that biodiversity was incredible. It's been a tough week watching these three presentations back to back to back and seeing all the amazing diversity of uh, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. It looks like an incredible, incredible uh, place to explore. You're a lucky guy. Indeed. All right. Very cool. Well, to those tuning in, it is now the Q&A action time. So there's two spots you can start sending me in some questions. You can use the question bar right in the GoToWebinar, and we'll grab some from there. As well, if you're in the Slido room, there's a spot uh, that you can drop some Q&A for us as well. And in fact, I accidentally closed the Slido room, so I'm going to reopen that so that I can start grabbing uh, some of those questions as well. So my first question for you as we wait for a few questions to come in is about uh, the time using the ROVs. What was the longest length of an ROV dive? 
Wow, that's a great question. I think uh, we recovered, well, we deployed early in the morning and recovered late at night. We didn't let it go overnight. Uh, and I think uh, a majority of the dives went for most of the day. So, so we deployed right after breakfast, probably around 8 a.m. and brought it in right before dinner, so maybe 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, now, if the basket got full early on, we brought it up, uh, but, but usually we left it down all day. Uh, the bio box or the basket where we collected all these specimens was pretty large. Uh, there were dividers and so we could keep track of what we were collecting and keep that remotely operated vehicle down. All right. So we have some good questions starting to come in. Susan is wondering if you saw any evidence of disease on any of the black corals. Ah, great question. Um, I did not, not a single colony. I didn't see any disease whatsoever. Um, in fact, in general, I don't know that I've ever seen disease at all on any black corals, deep sea, shallow, or otherwise. Uh, interesting. Maybe we're going to have to start looking into that a little bit further. Thank you for thank you for that question. All right. So Evan's curious about uh, the shark egg that you found. Is it unusual to see uh, something like that at that depth? So I, I actually have seen shark eggs. Uh, Fair, they're fairly common. Uh, it was unusual to me because it was laid on a black coral. I personally had not seen a shark egg on a black coral before, uh, but they are common uh, pretty much at all depths, uh, those shark eggs. Okay. Great question. So Elizabeth is curious about uh, predators of the black corals or anything that eats black coral, and if not, why not? Ah, well, <laughs> my favorite potential predator might be a shark and the reason i say that is there's a there's a species called staropathies arctica and the type specimen that is the first individual that that species ever found was found in the stomach of a shark so was the shark eating the coral or something that was swimming around the coral we don't know uh but but maybe sharks probably not uh but most likely probably just a uh, fish trying to trying to pick off. I, I would assume it's maybe just kind of uh, uh, incidental eating. Maybe they're trying to get a shrimp or something that's living on the coral and just happened to, to pick off a piece of the black coral. But uh, I don't know of a whole lot of predators. All right, so question just came in via the Slido room. It was quickly voted to the top. It's a good one. So normally we think of corals and you know some of the purposes they, they serve like nurseries or land barriers and such. Are, is there an ecological significance of, for black coral? Do they serve an important role um, in the ecosystem? Extremely important. They are literally the hotels of the ocean. So I, I glanced over it, but on one of my slides, uh, the introduction to the black corals, I showed you a big white black coral. That was Antipathies dendrochristos. That was collected off the coast of California. And uh, the researcher found almost 3,000 other invertebrates living on uh, that particular, that single black coral, 3,000 other uh, residents. And so very much a hotel uh, provide a habitat for other creatures. All right, very cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, this question comes up a little bit. I think it came up in some of our last ones as well. When you're collecting uh, those specimens, um, do you think there's much of an impact on the reef or is it such a small sample that it's negligible? Excellent question. So I, you know, once we learned the age of Leopathies being over 4,000 years old, it really got me thinking. And then seeing that uh, that glass sponge uh, being 18,000 years old really got me thinking, you know, we've got to be better about sampling these things. And so in general, when we do sample something that is known, we try to take off just a little tiny branch uh, to get a little bit of anatomy and just a little bit of tissue for the DNA. Uh, but if it is new to science, we've never seen it before, we need as much of that animal as possible so we can do a thorough description and put it in a, in a museum repository for other researchers to look at. Uh, but given how weedy these things are out there in the flower garden banks, uh, I'm not too concerned about taking little branches off one colony or, or you know, two here and there. Okay. So you've got Cole and Connor tuning in, and they're really interested in some of the rules around uh, black coral. Is it illegal to take it uh, in the U.S., and is, is it protected? Great, great, great question. So black corals are protected uh, by CITES, the Conservation on the International Trade of Endangered Species, Appendix 2. So even for a scientist, it's difficult to get samples. If I want a sample from a, an international researcher, 
they have to apply for a CITES permit, and they have to pay for that. Uh, then I have to inform U.S. Fish and Wildlife here in the U.S. that it's coming. Uh, I have to pay U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, once it comes in so they can ex inspect the package. So there's a lot of permit, a lot of cost involved in exchanging black corals internationally. But as long as it's collected within the U.S. EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, uh, we don't necessarily need permits uh, just to bring it back here into, into the mainland. However, in the flower garden banks, uh, east, west, and, and Stetson, um, you're going to need permits uh, to sample in the, in, the, in the sanctuary. All right. We've got a nice question here from Jubilee, who is curious about your favorite coral species. My favorite coral species. That's great. Um, it's the one that's going to be published in a week or two and named after one of my superheroes in the flower garden banks. So uh, stay tuned. It's green. It's it's highly branched. It's It's super, super cool. Can't wait for everybody to see it. Very cool. Evan would like to know about the size of the team that worked on this, this project, including support staff. Ah, that's a great question. So in terms of, so it was myself uh, and then two of my students, uh, but we also had uh, representatives from the Flower Garden Bank. So Marissa Nuttle was absolutely key uh, to this expedition. She is a wizard when it comes to knowing the names and ecology and evolutionary history of everything out there in the Flower Garden Bank. So I'm extremely thankful for, for her knowledge and friendship. Um, we also had a reporter from the Houston uh, Chronicle that was out there and, and did a really nice piece on the cruise and what we found. Um, and on top of that, it was uh, GFOE's uh, crew, so the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, uh, Todd Gregory, uh, and all of his engineers are running uh, running the robot and, and the telepresence. And, and of course, on top of that, nothing would be possible without the ship's crew, uh, keeping us fed, keeping the boat going, and, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, just an amazing team out there. All right. So Tara's curious about uh, the record-breaking glass sponge that was harvested. Um, was that internet? Oh, intentionally harvested. There we go. Was that intentionally harvested? That I don't know the answer to that. They found a couple individuals all around the South China Sea. Um, it looks like the whole colony, uh, whole sponge was collected. Um, I'm not sure that they knew the age before they collected them. It's usually not the case. You don't know till you know. Um, so, so I'm hopeful that we can get these things protected in some way, shape, or form now that we know how long lived they are. All right, another good question in the Slido room. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, coral at kind of the mesophotic range uh, in our last event, and they were kind of protected from some of the, the negative impacts of temperature changes due to their depth. Um, these deep sea, these corals, these black corals, what kind of impacts from us are they facing or ah, due to our changing ocean? Great question. So unlike the hard coral, a, a protein-based skeleton, and, and it's primarily protein and chitin, so they're not going to be subjected to the same problems of ocean acidification, uh, that is a decrease in pH that the stony corals are going to face. Um, and also, given their depth, they, they live well below the, the point where calcium carbonate goes into solution, um, and they're found worldwide. So, so I'm hopeful that ocean acidification doesn't hit them as hard as the other corals potentially. And, um, and I think given their worldwide distribution, it, it, it you know, almost down to 9,000 meters, I hope they're gonna have some refuge as the oceans continue to change. All right, absolutely. Uh, during your um, expedition, did you find any evidence of human impact or disturbance uh, in the sanctuary? Um, I don't recall any. Um, now, in previous cruises, we have seen anchors, ship anchors uh, out there, and we might have documented one on the cruise. Uh, but yeah, mostly anchors. Uh, at one point, we did see, I don't even know what it's called, but I, I think oil and gas companies drag it behind the boat uh, looking for oil and gas deposits. I don't know if it's a hydrophone or something, but it was laying across an entire reef. Um, those are the two things that stand out to me. Okay. A couple more questions here in the Slido room. Curious about the diet of the black coral. Ooh. <laughs> that's a really great question. Um, that's something that we're hoping to address uh, based on the samples we collected on this cruise. So uh, I, I, I passed over it, but one of the main goals was, was to look for new species of black corals. One of the second goals was to look at their microbiome, the things that live on them and in them, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, unicellular organisms. But by doing that genetic analysis, we're all going to 
we're also going to pick up what they're what they're eating. And so there's been some historic studies, you know, feeding them different things and looking in their in their polyps or their feeding mouths. But I think we got to use the, uh, the molecules to really get a, a fine resolution uh, look at it. Okay, and we've got we'll work in one more question here. It's from the Slido room as well, and curious about any adaptations that black coral might have for pressure. Ooh, adaptations for pressure. That is super cool. Uh, what we're, we're, we're taking a molecular approach and uh, anatomically, I don't see anything different than any other coral uh, per se, uh, but but the molecular level, uh, we're starting to sequence some of their full genetic blueprints and looking for uh, mechanisms that would allow them, genetic-based mechanisms that allow them to live at these uh, extreme pressures. Uh, also mechanisms that would allow them to not uh, get cancer or tumors. If you live 4,000 years and we don't see any evidence of uh, uncontrolled cell growth, what are they doing that other animals aren't? And so, so we're really getting into this aging and longevity question through DNA. All right, very cool. Well, I do want to start off with a big shout out to everybody who joined us live um, via the GoToWebinar today. Thanks for sending in some great questions. And to those who joined us all week, thanks for joining all the sessions. A huge shout out to everybody who played along in Slido today. Always fun to make things a little interactive. And Mercer, a huge thank you to you. That was a great presentation. Um, and you know, it just reaffirms that the field of studying our ocean is such an exciting one. There's still lots we have to figure out and there's lots of exciting marine careers uh, that any uh, of our younger viewers could be thinking about. Indeed, indeed. Thanks you. Thank you guys for the invitation and uh, to my audience. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. All right, I'm going to let Hannah take over for a moment and to wrap us up. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, thank you so much, Mercer, for such an engaging presentation. I also wanted to mention that I shared both the video that was an overview of the expedition from Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration and the article that the Houston Chronicle reported on this leg of the expedition in the chat. So after today's interaction, feel free to check those out. Both really great reads and watches. This recording, as well as all of the other interactions we've done, have been shared on Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants YouTube channel. So please feel free to check out all of those interactions there, including the two other expeditions that happened in Flower Garden Banks. This is our upcoming interaction that Joe mentioned earlier in the program. This one is super fun. On World Ocean Day, which happens to be Monday, June 8th, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries is launching our 360 degree video collection. So we will have four National Marine Sanctuaries highlighted in 360 degrees. And on Wednesday, June 10th for World Ocean Week, we are going to be introducing you to those and the videographer to bring you behind the scenes on 360 videos. So really an immersive way to connect with sanctuaries. If you're interested in more live interactions about the ocean and science, we run these interactions for students with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For educators, we also run a webinar series to learn how to bring marine science into the classroom. And I also wanted to highlight again Joe's programs with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, bringing explorers, scientists, researchers from all over the world right to your screen. And then also NOAA has another distance learning opportunity with Ocean Today that hosts once a month webinars. And following today's program, you will receive a link to a survey immediately after we end. This survey takes about three minutes. And if you happen to be an adult willing to participate, that would be great. The survey results help us decide the track of our distance learning programs, including topics, formats, and all other feedback is greatly appreciated. So we have about three minutes after today's program. We would love to hear from you. Again, I want to thank Joe from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and Dr. Mercer Brugler for presenting on his work with Black Corals in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Again, today's recording will be posted on Joe's YouTube channel with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Give us a few days to get the recording up but feel free to check out all of our other live interactions then. Thank you so much, and this concludes today's webinar. <laughs>